through the glen. Robin Hood, Robin Hood, with his band of men. Robin Hood, Robin Hood, Robin Hood, Robin Hood, could be a no for all the right on the retreat back to Sherwood. What's a good idea? Prime Minister, on this increasingly serious coal dispute, uh, why uh, has the employment legislation introduced under your government failed to have any useful effect? I don't accept it's failed to have any useful effect. Uh, with regard to what's happened on the picket lines, the criminal law on picketing has remained the same for centuries. And everyone knows what it is. You are entitled peacefully to persuade other people not to go to work if you wish. But the essential thing is peacefully to persuade. Large numbers are intimidation, and of course they can be threatening, and that is a matter for the criminal law. It is the police who are in charge of enforcing the criminal law, and the police, I think, have done a superb job. But why uh, has your employment legislation, namely the civil law against secondary picketing and secondary action, why has this not been invoked? Uh, Mr. McGregor did go to the courts, you'll remember, for an injunction. The civil law is there to be invoked if he wishes. Uh, it's just an extra thing which he can use, but the choice is his. If he feels he can secure his objective the better without using it, so be it. That is his choice. But there are other, there are other people involved in, the, in that. I mean, people who are being, whose coal supplies may be interrupted. Is, is, are you encouraging no one to, to invoke these, the, the prior and tepid laws, as they're called? It is for each person to decide whether they wish to invoke the law. At the moment, as you know, those miners who've decided to go to work are going to work. They can get through, and the police are saying that those who want to go to work do get through to their work. Uh, that, I think, is a very, very great achievement. But uh, as regards the law, you see, you said that Mr. Mr. McGregor had gone to the court for an injunction against the picketing by um, Yorkshire miners of people in Nottinghamshire and elsewhere, but nobody had taken any notice of that. It's for him to decide whether he needs to go further with that law to achieve his objective. But his objective is exactly the same as ours. It's a prosperous coal industry with a good future. At the moment, as you know, the miners are divided. Some passionately want to work and are working. Others want to vote and are not being allowed to vote. But at the moment, many pits are working and working very well indeed is mr scargill correct when he says that mr mcgregor wants to cut the coal industry down to a hundred pits and a hundred thousand men mr mcgregor and the government want a good prosperous coal industry producing coal economically at a competitive price that it can sell because it affects not only those who work in the coal industry it affects so many others as well a lot of industries need good cheap coal. No government has done more for a good coal industry than this one. You cannot name any government throughout history which has invested more in the future of coal than this conservative government. But does the plan mean uh, cutting the number of pits down to about a hundred? As, I think as the Mr. Plan... Scargo keeps saying to his men, some of whom appear to believe it. You well, you go back uh, for the plan for coal to 1974 when the Labour government started a plan for coal and it was later uh, revised. Um, it uh, involved agreements on productivity, agreements on investment, uh, agreements on closing down the older pits. It was then revised. Over 11 years, uh, Labour closed 300 pits. Over nine years, Conservative government have closed 92 pits. So there's no difference between us that certain pits have to be closed down. The choice that we have to make, I think, under this government is, do you subsidize the older pits, which are not as good, not as healthy, not as good to work in, or do you in fact put your money into investing in the new pits, much healthier for miners, much better equipped with a future? We understand? have taken the view, and I think it was the view taken by previous Labour governments, that the thing to do is to invest in the future. And indeed, as I've indicated, on the pit closures, we have not followed a different path from Labour. We have put more money into investment, and that, I hope, is an earnest of our confidence in the future of the coal pits and coal mining industry in indeed, this country. Indeed, uh, three years ago, you gave way to the threat of a strike and postponed pit closures in order to get on well with the miners, didn't you? We are 
now putting heavy investment into the future. Into pits like Selby, uh, we, had, we took a decision to open up um, more coal mining facilities at Asfordby. Not an easy decision because you know you had to balance things between the needs of the environment. It's a very beautiful area and the needs of coal mining. Do you understand though, uh, Prime Minister, the fears expressed even by moderate miners' leaders that the McGregor closures will, as they put it, butcher their industry and uh, uh, leave whole pit communities without work and perhaps hope, as they see it. The McGregor plan will give this country the best hope of a good coal industry it's ever had. That, I think, is what miners want, and I think they want the future to be that for their families who can now go and work in far better conditions than ever in the past. If you have a choice to subsidize older pits, not as healthy, not as safe, and many of us wouldn't wish miners to work in those conditions, or to put money into the future, which, if you're really concerned, do you take? Because don't forget, it's taxpayers' money. This year we're putting in, all the taxpayers are putting in, 1.3 thousand million pounds. That's the measure of their faith and this government's confidence in the future of coal. I think they feel and I feel that the, the, the pay keeps the miners sort of 25% above average earnings in other industries. The investment is excellent, two million pounds a day. And should some miners have to take early retirement, the deal that he's been offered is a very good one. And so it should be, because it's been their capital, as it were. Why hasn't the government... That is a good deal. It's a good deal for an industry with a future. Why hasn't the government arranged for Parliament, after these weeks of this uh, very difficult dispute, to debate these matters and to hear these arguments, which you've been explaining here on Panorama, on the floor of the House of Commons? But we've had two debates on the coal industry, quite wide-ranging debates, in the month of March. We had two because the financing came up. We've had one private notice question. I am answering questions to Tuesday and Thursday almost every week and of course it always comes up so there's been no shortage the other day we had a debate on what's called the Easter adjournment and it was raised then that was Thursday night so it isn't as if these things have not been raised but in you've Parliament. left it uh, open to the Labour Party a Labour backbencher to get an emergency debate tomorrow on simply on the question of police tactics when that tend to look to the public as if somehow the police are in the dock in Parliament instead of discussing the whole issue? He must take responsibility for the kind of debate he's asked. Most of us who have watched the scenes on television have only the highest praise for the police. They indeed have kept the right of minors to go to work open and they've done it marvellously. You have no anxieties about some of the allegations made about the police, such as asking people how they voted and stopping people from going to Nottingham at Dartford Tunnel and so on? The police have to keep the right to go to work. They have to keep it open. It is well known that they can, in fact, stop cars if they are going to... Um uh, carry out what they believe would be a breach of the peace. That is well established in law. If there are individual complaints about policemen, there's a well established machinery to pursue them. I think it totally and utterly false to cast a slur on the police for the superb way in which they have handled this dispute and the way in which they've kept open a man's right to go to his place of work unmolested. That is a fundamental right in this country, and it would be far better if people looked on who is trying to stop that right and criticise them. Nonetheless, you would agree, would you not, Prime Minister, that it is vitally important in a country such as ours that the police, under their chief constable, should be upholding the law and seen to be upholding the law rather than to be upholding the government. I believe the police are upholding the law. They are not upholding the government. This is not a dispute between miners and government. This is a dispute between miners and miners. They have in their constitution the right to have a ballot. They've not been able to have a national ballot yet. Many of them have had local ballots. This is a dispute between miners and miners. It's some of the miners who are trying to stop other miners going to work. It is the police who are in charge of upholding the law. If there are individual complaints, it is not for us to make complaints. If there are individual complaints, there's a well-known machinery for pursuing them. But I would be very, very concerned indeed if I thought that people were going for the police except on specific complaints. The police have been wonderful. On a totally different issue, um, Prime Minister, why are you so determined to go ahead with the controversial legislation to abolish 
The GLC and the six metropolitan counties, a measure which is opposed by some of your most senior former cabinet colleagues and others. First, because all Conservative members of Parliament fought the last election on that basis. Uh, we heard very, very little comment or complaint about it then. That was the basis on which we fought. 13 million people endorsed that, and so we shall go ahead with it. The real reason is that there is so much duplication and overlap between uh, your metropolitan counties uh, and your districts, and I believe that the time has come to return more of the powers to local authorities. Many of them are already exercised by the districts already. Are you saying that it's got nothing to do with the fact that all these authorities are labour-controlled? No, it has not. Um, we, in fact, created, as you know, a number of the metropolitan counties. Uh, I frankly think that we made a mistake in creating them. I remember vividly at the time I was in charge of education as Secretary of State for Education. It was suggested that I put education to the upper tier. I absolutely refused to do so because I believe that education is better handled at the district level, particularly the schools. So the metropolitan counties never had education. Uh, many of the, the powers which they operate, for example, planning, are also operated at district level, and therefore you have duplication. And I think the time has come to say there is not sufficient for the upper tiers to do. Uh, they really have um, too little to do. Well, there is are, too are much you, duplication, and that is the real reason why they must go. On the, on the GLC, are you not uh, concerned by a recent opinion poll which showed 61% of Londoners against abol abolishing the GLC? No, I'm not concerned about that at all. It was a poll taken, I think, of about a thousand people, and I could say, look, I had a poll taken of the, of the whole country during the election. You know, as far as the GLC is concerned, the police powers exercised by the Home Secretary, not the GLC. The housing powers ceased to be exercised by GLC and were returned to the district some time ago. And the districts, I think, exercised them very much better. Uh, I think that the, the, the powers with regard to fire uh, can be exercised by joint boards. With regard to education, the outer London boroughs already have educational powers. It is only the inner London authorities that have education exercised through the GLC or through ILIA. And that, as you know, we made an announcement that there will be an elected authority uh, for you that. You are entitled to say that you had a pledge in your manifesto to do this. You didn't say anything in the manifesto about cancelling the elections and substituting a nominated body from the borough councils. Why not extend the life of the present elected councils and do it that way? I think it would perhaps be really rather more dangerous to extend the life of elected councils. You could argue that that would be a more dangerous precedent than allowing them to serve the full elected time for which they were elected. No one is being cut off. They're having the full time for which they're elected as councillor. When that comes to an end, there's only a year before GLC is abolished, and it seems really rather ridiculous to hold other elections. Isn't it better to say, we'll put it over to the elected representatives of the districts who are in fact going to be able to exercise most of the powers which the GLC exercised. So it's going over to elected representatives uh, within their period of election of the authorities which will have the responsibility for discharging the duties which go to them. On another matter, on, again, on which you're going to get, uh, you've had trouble from your parliamentary supporters, uh, why is the government afraid to, or unwilling to use its majority to change the law on the political levy? to a system of contracting in so that trade union members would not have to contract out of the levy if they don't wish to pay it. We said quite clearly in the manifesto on which we fought the election, on which we won, and which we upheld, that first we'd try to come to a voluntary arrangement with the unions, that they would make it quite clear that people were not compelled uh, to, to pay a levy. But you come if they to a voluntary arrangement with the TUC, which come, has no power over you. You come to a voluntary arrangement with the TUC. We will see if that voluntary arrangement works. If it doesn't, as we've made it clear, we will have, still have the right to bring in legislation. But, but we set out what we would do in the manifesto, and we're trying to do that. If we can get it voluntarily, so be it. That's better. If but we it, can't and it doesn't work, then we shall have to bring in legislation. But isn't the blunt truth that you're holding back from this so as to avoid pressure for legislation against company contributions to Tory funds? Uh, no, Sir Robin. The, the two are really totally different. Uh, no one is compelled. Uh, to contribute to Tory party funds. Everyone who does, who is a company, has to make it public knowledge. The two are totally different. What I said was we would try to do the uh, arrangements with the unions voluntarily, 
and we're upholding that. Of course, there is another suggestion, is that you really want to keep the Labour Party in funds, even though they're the official opposition, because you are really more scared of the alliance, which came second in twice as many Tory seats as did the Labour Party. No, I'm not scared of the alliance at all. Uh, well, we won't talk about the alliance except perhaps in this connection. But I do think that it is important that political parties raise their own funds to fight elections. I do think it would be a very retrograde step if in this country we said, right, political parties are going to, to, to compel contributions from the taxpayer. Well, I think that would be very, very bad indeed. In your recent Birmingham speech, Prime Minister, you remember that you claimed that the British people now have, and I quote, a radical government with a powerful purpose and a clear idea of where it is going. Now, how can you claim to be a radical Tory government with a powerful purpose when public expenditure now takes a bigger proportion of the national wealth than when you first took power nearly five years ago? Uh, yes, it does in almost every country in Europe and in the States during a period of recession. Because your income goes down during a period of recession, it has in Europe, it has in the States, but you can't suddenly cut your expenditure. Uh, what we have done is swung some of the taxation away from direct taxation to indirect taxation. And as you know, it's the labor structure of income tax were still in existence now, people would be paying three and a half billion pounds more in income tax today than they are. And also we've taken a lot of direct taxation away from companies because Labour put on that monstrous national insurance surcharge which is a tax on jobs and we've taken that off. But aren't you disappointed at having failed to reduce public expenditure uh, as a proportion of the national income because you said in your 1979 manifesto and I quote, the state takes too much of the nation's income income, its share must be steadily reduced, and it has steadily gone up. That is correct for the, in, for the reason which I've indicated. When you have a recession, you're in fact your income comes back faster than you can cut your public expenditure. And although the question you have put is one which pundits and, and commentators often put, in Parliament you will find that I am criticised for trying to cut public expenditure too much and I reckon we've got it about right. Yes, I have cut some things. Uh, they needed to be cut. Other things I have held uh, and with the, the, um, the public expenditure forecasts that we fought the election on have been held absolutely. What that means is as we get growth, the growth really should be available to go to reducing taxation. And believe you me, if I gave in every Tuesday and every Thursday that the demands made upon me by the Labour Party, by the Alliance, sometimes even by one or two of our own people, taxation would be very much higher than it is just after the budget. That fantastically a uh, successful budget when Nigel Lawson laid out the future for a parliament and said, look, you can have a choice, more public expenditure or lower taxation. And most of us want lower taxation. And I think that's what most people... Do you know what the, the, the next question I got the next week? Please would we put up the unemployment benefit to the long-term supplementary benefit rate. Do you know how much that would cost? Four hundred and fifty million pounds. No, we have got it right, Sir Robin. Well, Just about all things considered, we have got it right by very disciplined control and by doing it fairly. A fair deal for the weaker members of our society and a fair deal for the taxpayers. You say you've got it right, but how can you have got it right when unemployment is still going up? Uh, that is perhaps not quite so much a matter of public expenditure, although it does in fact cost six billion. Uh, if some of the people who criticise... He says it costs 15 billion in the uh, budget debate. We have debate. had this argument before. I can right, tell right. you it cost us exactly this year six billion, because that in fact is the amount which you pay out in unemployment benefit and the amount which then you pay out uh, in supplementary benefit, which a number of people depend upon, and that it comes to about six billion. This year it was five billion last year, but the... Uh, the um, the benefits have gone up. Um, now, if many, many of the people who criticise us for unemployment, and I'm the first to want to get unemployment down, went out or were capable of going out and starting up wealth creating businesses of their own, we'd be a great deal better off. There are not a lot of people who can. Fortunately, there are more and more who are doing it. But employment, good employment, profitable employment, good jobs are created by those who can start a business, expand it, build it up, please the customers, make a profit, 
plow it back, expand. But are you saying That's the government has no role in this, you see, because Sir Ian Gilmore, your former cabinet minister, and Mr Heath, they both argue, and others, they say that we've got to take the once-for-all opportunity of North Sea oil revenue to put some money into the economy to create some jobs on a selective basis, particularly the construction industry, Mr Heath suggests. Now, what's wrong with that? North Sea oil revenue is already being used, as my backbenchers know, already being used to the full. And some of them are the first to demand extra public expenditure, although they know it's being used to the full. But let me point this out about North Sea oil revenue. Uh, it won't go on for an unlimited time, as we all know. But in a way, we are making provision for the future, because a good deal of money is going from here to be invested overseas. Now that is a good thing. We're getting a lot of money in here which is invested here. A lot of money was invested in North Sea oil to enable it to be developed and we have to pay out interest and dividends on that. But a lot of money since the end of exchange controls by pension funds, whether they be trade union pension funds or other pension funds, has gone overseas. Indeed, our investment overseas has gone up from 15 billion in 1979 to 50 billion. That is very good. It's already producing income back of 2.5 billion a year. That will be the nest egg which we'll have and we'll build it up when North Sea oil has gone. But you're so we are in fact using up one asset which people enabled <coughs> us to develop by investing here and we're building up other assets overseas commensurate with those which we used to have in pre-war days. But your critic, Prime Minister, will be appalled to hear you taking pride in the fact that North Sea oil revenue is going abroad instead of being put into uh, <coughs> operations here in order to increase jobs, in order to bring the mass unemployment down. Investment will go where it is profitable for it to go. The pension funds, insurance funds, who have to look after the income of their beneficiaries will invest where it is profitable to invest. There is no shortage of money in this country for profitable investment. There is quite a good deal of money looking for profitable investment. So when we get our industries profitable, you will find that there is sufficient, and I, did, I think even Mr. Harold Wilson said that in the inquiry he has. So. We have to get our industries profitable, and if I might say so, Robin, Sir Robin, I'm sorry, I really, I'm so sorry, uh, then no one, in fact, has done more to try to get industry profitable than this government or to create the conditions, and we are succeeding. Profits are going up. Industrial production is going up. Industries are expanding. New industries are being created. We have more self-employed than we've ever had before. Yes, there is a new kind of industrial revolution coming. The electronics industry is doing well. Yes, Britain is on the move mm. into industries with good prospects, with a good future. What sort of that a has happened but under what, the lifetime of this government. But what sort of a recovery is it and what sort of move is it if unemployment is not being reduced and unemployment is in fact still going up? I mean, I read in the Daily Telegraph the other day that ministers are very puzzled by the fact that unemployment is still going up in real terms. Is that correct? No, I saw that phrase. I saw the phrase puzzle. But actually, if you look at the numbers of people of working age, uh, because of past baby booms, they're now school leavers. And between 1978, 79 and 84, there are a million more people of working age, because the school leavers now, the baby boom, are coming into the period of working age. So you have actually to create more jobs to stand still. Uh, and it will go on until about 1978-79. So we have more coming onto the labor market. So I think we're not puzzled. And of course, industries still are becoming steadily more and more efficient, but more are being created. When That's think, the important when thing. When do you think unemployment will start to come down, Prime Minister? I am not going to predict it's a hostage to fortune. What I'm going to say is this. We are creating the right conditions for industries to be able to flourish, whether they're industrial, whether they're service. We're keeping down inflation. We're running the economy of this country in a sound way. People know that we will stick to what we say. We'll go on running it in a sound way. We are trying to do everything to give incentives to individuals. I mentioned income tax a moment ago. Incentive to companies. I mentioned the reduction of the national insurance surcharge to help jobs. 
cutting corporation tax so it will be worthwhile making profits and making it much more neutral as between investment in capital and investment in people. But so we are doing all the right things to get future good and profitable industry. And Sir Robin, it is working. But when you ask your expert advisors and officials and economists who are all over Whitehall and near number 10, uh, when you ask them when will unemployment start coming down, what do they tell you? Oh, they'll give you all sorts of forecasts based on all sorts of assumptions. But the results they get out depend upon the assumptions they put in, because no one, in fact, makes a forecast. It will depend upon world conditions. It will depend upon how we take advantage of the opportunities. It will depend upon how many people start up on their own. It will depend upon how successful they are. It will depend upon how wages move in this country compared with how wages move in others. It will depend upon productivity. It will depend upon good design. It will depend upon go-getters it will depend upon having an enterprising culture. All of those things. Well, but good heavens, we were first into the first industrial revolution, but and now at last we're doing well on electronics, and I hope we're going to do very well on the service the industry. The present chance of the Exchequer, you'll remember, when he was, uh, had another job during the uh, election campaign, mm -hmm. predicted that unemployment would start to fall this year, but uh, it hasn't happened, has I'm it? I'm more cautious than he is. A good deal more cautious. It's rising more slowly, but because of this great big demographic thing, we've got a million more people of working age, and more school leavers coming onto the market, although um, at the moment uh, more school leavers are getting jobs, fortunately. I'm just very cautious, because I know it depends not upon talk of either economists, or if I might say so, politicians. It depends on the doers. The people who go out and create the wealth, the men and women who work in industry, in service industry, in yes. offices, it depends yes, upon it, them. It, it Not on the pontificators, but on the doers. Of course, when you and I were younger, Prime Minister, it used to be, associated, used to be assumed that government was part of the doers, that government had a contribution to make to create jobs and to create wealth. Not all, not the whole responsibility, but it had a contribution. This government has made a splendid contribution. If we'd had governments in the past that would have kept inflation down, British industry would have been in a great deal better state than it was when I took it over. You don't hear this uh, government being in trouble with deficits. You have many other governments being in trouble with deficits, not this one. You don't hear of this government raising too much money overseas which it can't afford to pay back. This government's paid back the debts which previous government, the previous Labour government, got into. Yes, we are running our economy in a very sound way. We have taken off a lot of the controls, and a lot of the controls hindered industry in its start. We are putting on incentives, everything from share options to enable ordinary folk to have a very much better share in the industry in which they work. We are denationalising and giving preference to the people who work in an industry. Okay. All of these things we are doing. Let's so we're saying, it doesn't matter who you are, where you come from. It's if you can make a contribution to our society, and if you can, and if you can build up a fortune to yourself, jolly good luck to you, because in doing so, you will help to create jobs for others. And I want the successful people here, and that is the sort of economy that I'm building. Not an envious society, but a go-getter society, which will in fact create profitable business and good jobs for other people but with you a can't good give, future. But you can't give those watching who may not, not all of them may be go-getters, but when is your go-getting society and your successful entrepreneurs, when are they going to create the conditions with government help perhaps, which will uh, start to reduce the mass unemployment? Well, already. One year, uh, two let me years, take, let me three take, years? Well, let me take some examples. The chemical industry is doing extremely well. It's getting other world chemical industry beaten. The vehicle industry is coming up very, very fast indeed. Small business is starting, and we have done a tremendous amount of help to that. The electronics business is also getting away to a very, very fast start. A late start, but a very, very fast start. Of course, we are also in a technological revolution, and we shall have, in fact, to pick up on service industries. But bearing in mind the increased numbers of people of working age, new jobs are being created, but for a time they will not in fact show in the unemployment figures. But when you look at the proportion of people in work, let me make this perfectly clear. We have a bigger proportion of our population in work than they have in France. This of course is because we have rather more married women working than they do in France. Well, and we have a bigger proportion of many industrial countries of our population in work. Well, uh, you, you've uh, 
put your case with great force on that, and I'd like to move to another topic because there are many interesting ones to discuss. There are a lot of people who, when we talk about public expenditure and so on and so forth, wonder how you can possibly justify the cost of the Trident nuclear missile program, which, as you know, has escalated in cost to nearly nine billion pounds altogether. Uh, and they ask this question because they are told by a lot of people who argue about it that the use of such a weapon would be national suicide. Now, which question are you asking first? Uh, first, Trident. It's 3% of the lifetime in which we acquired. It's 3% of the defence budget. 6% of the equipment budget. Yes, 3% of the defence budget. 6% of the equipment budget. We could not possibly get such good deterrent value for that money as we get in Trident. Now, do we, should we have Trident? Yes. We must, I believe, have an independent nuclear deterrent in this country. The alternative is if you don't have one yourself, you rely on someone else's umbrella. So you can't have a moral uh, case against it if you say, well, we're not going to have it, we're going to re rely on someone else's use of it. So there can be no moral case against it. But some of those people who say we must not have it try to deploy a moral case against it. I do not recognize, I must say, a moral case against it for this reason. Either we have these weapons or we leave them totally in the hands of the potential aggressor. To leave the world's most powerful weapons totally in the hands of a potential aggressor seems to me the height of absurdity and danger. I wouldn't do it because they then only have to threaten you. How if they threatened you with nuclear weapons and you had none to deter? Could you put your conventional forces in to fight knowing that you could be but threatened? Supposing they the threaten alternative you with, would be surrender. Supposing they threaten you with their massive conventional forces, is our answer to use, to rely on the, the nuclear deterrent first? The nuclear deterrent is there to deter all war, and it has. And that is what my critics cannot get over. We've had the longest period of peace for a very long time. To me, that is the most valuable thing of all. The nuclear deterrent has deterred not only nuclear war, because it is so horrific. Cute. It has deterred conventional war. And please don't think conventional war was cozy. It was terrible. Absolutely dreadful, as anyone who came through the last war knows, and the number of people who lost their life. It has deterred that terror as well. Do you um, have a hope, are you hopeful of opening up a dialogue, a new dialogue with the Soviet Union as a, as a, as a British policy, bearing in mind the, the very stern things you were saying about Russia until quite recently? Look, I believe passionately in our way of life. We would all say, if we were asked to say, what is the characteristic of Britain? Everyone would say the same. We're a free country, and we're going to stay that way. We take it for granted. It shouldn't be taken for granted. We believe in freedom and justice. We want peace with freedom and justice. We will argue our case for our way of life against anyone else in the world, against theirs. It is a far superior system for individuals, free men and women. Are you thinking, are you thinking so of going I, to Moscow to talk with them? Yes, but can I, you were talking about some of the things that I've said about communism. I would still say that a free way of life gives both dignity and prosperity, which you do not get in communism. I do not retreat from that one moment. But I was getting very worried that somehow we were not getting to grips with some of the other problems. We'd had various kinds of disarmament talks going on for a long time about the strategic nuclear weapons, about the theater nuclear weapons, about the conventional weapons, about chemical weapons. The conventional weapons going on for nine years, the, the nuclear weapons going on for a long time. Now, we were not getting anywhere very fast. And I think we gradually a number has got together and began to think, what can we do about this? By, the, by we, you mean Britain? Well, well, within we're Britain, not involved in most of those talks. No, well, well, no, we're not involved. We kept very, very closely in touch with us. We worked very closely with the United States, and we put our input put in discussions into them. But they weren't getting anywhere, Sir Robin. And I felt that we couldn't leave it like that. And I felt that perhaps we should tackle it in a different way. If we got a greater understanding across the political divide, and it is a political divide,
If we got a greater understanding across that, then you might find that those disarmament talks might go better. Now, we in NATO are totally defensive. No one needs fear anything from us at all. We will not pursue our way of life by force. It's so not in our creed to do so. I do want to talk across the divide, and that's why I went to Hungary and why uh, I wanted also uh, to talk more widely. Because I think when we get that greater understanding, and I think when they understand that we are not threatening them, NATO threatens what no is the one, next step they might you? get that. What's what the next, is the step, next step, step in talking across the Great Divide? To invite Mr. Chanyenko here, perhaps? Well, I, I think you're, you're jumping a little bit much too fast. You know, you don't get instant success on this. You have to build it up slowly and steadily. But when I went to Moscow, we did mention that could we reinstate Mr. Kornienko's visit, which had been stopped because of the shooting down of the Korean airliner. And don't forget, previously, relations had been bad because of Af Afghanistan. Now, that visit was reinstated, his been. Um, uh, Sir Geoffrey Howe will be going to see Mr. Grumiko in Moscow in July. Uh, I also, as you know, talked in Hungary, and I think got just a greater understanding of their viewpoint and made it perfectly clear. NATO threatens no one. We have to get this message across. Democracies are peace-loving by their very nature. So doesn't it make sense for the democracies and for the, the communist bloc to say, look, we're both spending far too much on weapons. We both wish to be secure. Can we not keep our security but a lower level of men and weaponry by agreements that we come down and also by verifying what each other is doing? That makes sense for us. It makes sense to them. We have a common interest in this and I wish to pursue it very vigorously because I think if we get a greater understanding and you always benefit from dialogue and talking, we might get that greater trust. In any event, we might avoid misunderstanding, and then we might get a movement in these disarmament talks, which is so important. Could I draw you back to that uh, old familiar subject of the common market budget, Prime Minister? Talks are resumed again today, I think, with our foreign ministers. Um, are you hopeful of getting it settled this time? No. I'm always hopeful. I don't know whether it will be settled. If it isn't, we shall go on. The, we have made really great strides in the agricultural policy, which would not have been made without Britain's influence. Let's be absolutely clear about that. Britain has done a very great deal in making the common market face up to fundamental issues. We now have this other one. Britain deserves a fair deal uh, in the amount uh, by which she finances the common market. What, is the, gap? what is the gap between us now? 150 well, million pounds? No, I don't think you can, do, you can say it that way because it's not a gap in any particular one year. It's the figures that you put in for the first year will become multiplied in future years as the budget goes up and that's why it's so important to get the first starting figure because you get a multiplied effect. And what is left years. now to get right? Well we've got the system, at least I believe we've got the system. What we have to do is to get the starting point. The starting point is supremely important because it has a multiplier effect in future years. You can't just say it's that gap. As the money going into the common market rises, the gap will get larger. So, in fact, you have to get it right. Well, are and you then, when we've done that, there will be so many more things we can do. Are you reasonably confident that this week, Prime Minister, you will get what you called and what you want, and I quote, a fair system of financing and disciplined expenditure so that we can put behind us this endless haggling over money? We're well on the way to getting a system of disciplined expenditure, again, uh, due to Britain. As we say, look, you simply must decide at the beginning of the year how much money you can spend and how much you can spend on agriculture. That, again, is due to Britain's firmness. That's two things due to Britain's firmness. We still have to get the third. We shall, I believe, get the third. Indeed, I am fairly confident we shall get the third uh, because... Um, they recognize our case and it is still just a question of deciding uh, the details and how much. They said I an awful lot of unkind things about you, Prime Minister. They seemed to find you very tiresome at the last summit, didn't they? Uh, they're tiresome. And they're nine to one. And there are nine of them being tiresome and only one of me. And I can cope with nine of them, so they ought to be able to stand one of me. And anyway, they could end, end the tiresomeness and the stubbornness by giving me what I want, which is a fair deal for Britain, and I shall go on till I get a fair deal. But it will be a fair and reasonable deal, because I want to get it over. I'm fed up of haggling about this. And there are far more important things for us to do in the future. And no one has greater vision about what Europe can do as an entity than Britain. And no one has done more for Europe over past years than Britain. On another matter, 
Prime Minister. What is your reaction to the view of Mr. Peter Shaw, the shadow leader of the House, that there are still questions about the Oman contract and your son, Mark, which you have a public duty to answer? Well, he's had the relevant answers. The House has had the relevant answers. He may not like the answers, but um, that's not my fault. But the relevant answer he says he hasn't had, and other people say also, uh, that uh, you haven't answered the question as to when you were in Oman, did you know of your son's financial interest in the cementation bit? I answer for what I do. I have answered for what I do. I have said perfectly clearly it was up to a man to whom they allocated this right to negotiate and eventually the contract. I don't mention the names of particular British companies and didn't on that occasion. I said it is vitally important, I believe, that the business comes to Britain. I have answered fully for my role. The business did come to Britain. That business and a lot of other business in the rest of the Gulf now what are they saying I did wrong? Did wrong in getting business for Britain? Some 400 companies? What are they saying I did wrong? Batting for Britain? I shall go on batting for Britain. Were you at any time advised or warned by your officials about a possible conflict of interest between your public duties and your son's private interests? As I have indicated in the House, on many occasions, I was advised to raise the matter of the whole university contract with the government of Oman. That I did. I did it, I believe, very forcefully because I wanted the business to come to Britain. The business did come to Britain. Some 400 companies are involved. I am sorry that the Labour Party doesn't like the business coming to Britain. I'm very sorry, but I shall go on trying to bat for Britain, getting more business for Britain, and on that tour I got contracts worth hundreds of millions of pounds well, leave... and scarcely a week goes by now without my being asked to back up the demand, to back up the representations that British companies are making to try to get business overseas because competitors, governments back there. Let me ask you one more question on this matter mm. uh, because you've made your position clear on it. Can you give the public, the people, an assurance that if all the facts were disclosed about this matter, there would be no evidence of any impropriety on your part and no breach of the rigorous standards we all expect from people in public life. I believe that is correct. Then why not publish all the facts? Because the facts will be published in due course of time, but you know for when the 30-year records come, of course oh. they will. Of course they will. But you know as well as I do, Sir Robin, that discussions between heads of government are confidential. And what do you think? Are you really suggesting that I should have confidential discussions with other heads of government, that I should break confidentiality, that I should break confidentiality on commercial contracts? Are you really suggesting? Is the Labour Party really suggesting? that that's the way for Britain to behave, that that's the way to get contracts for Britain? Are they really suggesting that the right way for a head of a British government is to breach confidentiality? What they are complaining about is that as a result of work that the British Prime Minister did, did correctly, did on advice from government departments, did on advice from the relevant departments, work came to Britain. They haven't been able to say that a single thing which I did was wrong. Not a single thing. The work came to Britain. What they have it said, was the government what they of Oman said, who decided what they, to whom it should go. What they have said that, that is wrong is that you refuse to say whether you knew that your son had a financial interest. I answer for what I do. Okay. So, Robin, well, what, we're going, are we went, what are you alleging that I did wrong? I'm not suggesting anything. I'm just putting to you the questions which they say you have not answered and we'll leave yeah, it you're there. You're acting as a person. Let us leave it there. Yes. Well, uh, Mrs. Thatcher, do you intend to lead the Conservative Party into the next election in, I say, 87? So. I hope so. Uh, of course, if you do do that, uh, if, and let's say that the next election is in the autumn of 1987, do you realise then that you will have been uh, held the office of Prime Minister for a longer for the longest continuous period of this century and possibly long before that? Yes. Eight and a half years. And you'll be it's six... Not very long. Eight and a half years. Yes, it's not very long if you look back to other times. And you'll be 62? You still think you want to go ahead at the next election? Yes. I shall be a very fit 62. I, you... I, I, you might be a little bit nearer that than I am, but you feel all right? 
forgive, forgive me if I don't, don't, don't answer that question, Prime Minister, at the, towards the end of this interesting interview. One of your most uh, famous declarations, Prime Minister, which everyone will remember, was when you said, this was just before you took office, I am not a consensus politician or a pragmatic politician, I am a conviction politician. After five years as Prime Minister, are you still a conviction politician, despite what the realities of office have taught you? Most certainly. I make it perfectly clear what I believe in, then I set about to translate my beliefs into action. Then I say, all right, you are free to accept or reject. But in fact, the convictions which I've had are really beginning to show results. We have a sound financial policy, we're upholding a rule of law, we have a sound defense policy, we've protected the weak, we've done far better by the National Health Service and the Labour Party. We have in fact carried out the things which we said we're going to do. We had the biggest privatization program of any conservative government and we're going to continue. We are succeeding, we're going to continue to succeed. And I believe in saying what I do. Do you think that any of the great politicians or the great faiths of the world would ever have got anywhere if people had gone out and said, brothers, I believe in consensus? No, they didn't. They went out and said, this is what I believe. Yes. If you believe that too, but uh, could not, uh, not your free to reject me. There are those, including many in your own party, Prime Minister, who think the country at this time could do with a bit less conviction, which means belief beyond argument, and a bit more consensus, which means reasoning together as one nation. Uh, we got a really rather good consensus, I thought, during the last election. Consensus behind my convictions. You Only 42% of the people. 42% of the people, a very, very good majority, far more than anyone else got for theirs, far more than anyone else. No, I believe that we have set about it the right way. Do you really think that consensus, trying to conceal what you believe and saying, just appoint me and I'll do what's pragmatic... Consensus or, means getting agreement with other people. Do not, know, doesn't mean concealing anything. I was anything. asked in an international conference, I said to one of my colleagues, who shall be nameless and who will stay nameless in spite of all efforts to try to, to uh, ask me to reveal it was, I said, why do you say on that particular occasion they got a consensus? Well, he said, you have to because they couldn't reach agreement. No, okay. I go for agreement, agreement for the things I want to do. And if you get agreement, you don't need we'll consensus. We'd better leave it there, otherwise... Consensus we'll... is too wishy-washy, Sir Robin. Otherwise, we'll, clear. we'll hold up the nine o'clock news, which will tell I'm us what you've been terrible. saying. Uh, Prime Minister, thank you. Thank you.